the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Embargo, Guantanamo Bay, Elian Gonzalez, Alan Gross. Ever since the Cuban Revolution of 1952 to 1959 forced President Fulgencio Batista, an ally of the United States, into exile and replaced him with Fidel Castro's communist government, the relationship between Cuba and the US has been volatile. Last December, President Obama and Cuban President Raul Castro announced the beginning of a process of normalizing relations between the two countries, which media sources have named the Cuban Thaw. What does this mean for business, tourism, human rights, not to mention Major League Baseball? U.S. Congresswoman Barbara Lee has made more than 20 trips to Cuba, worked unceasingly as an activist for normalizing relationships between the two countries, and in December met with President Raul Castro in the first face-to-face -face session between U.S. lawmakers and Cuban leaders in at least five years. She's joined in conversation tonight by Nick Miroff, Latin American correspondent for the Washington Post, who covers the territory from the US-Mexico borderlands to the southern cone of South America, and KQED's Michael Krasny, who traveled to Cuba with the JCCSF and has interviewed countless experts and read extensively on the subject. Please join me in welcoming them all to the JCCSF. Welcome. Glad to be here. And um, how many of you really excited about the opening up of relations with Cuba? <laughs> oh. This lady has done a lot of the work uh, behind the scenes and uh, certainly deserves credit for that. As well as, yes. And I said to uh, Congresswoman Lee before we came out here that, um, like I suspect many people in this room, I have a great deal of esteem for her and respect because she was able to stand up and one of the few who stood up against the Iraq war. We thank you very much. And I'm glad to be with Nick Moritz, who, of course, uh, has had his education in Berkeley, uh, got a graduate degree there, worked with Cynthia Gorney. Uh, who I've worked with at KQED and who is terrific, and uh, Nick has done yeoman work as a journalist. So we've got two wonderful people here to talk about Cuba and to talk about what's, uh, what's up ahead. Maybe, uh, Barbara Lee, you can tell us initially uh, what you foresee in the way this is going to be navigated vis-a-vis -vis Congress and how it's going to follow a certain route, or sure. what do you foresee on that line? Well, there's no going back, that's for sure. <laughs> no going back. I think at this point what uh, we have to do in Congress is to actually pass two bills which would actually fully lift the embargo. One is a bill that I'm co-sponsoring with Congressman Rangel, and I have the bill numbers HR 66, HR 403, that's the right to travel, and then ending the full embargo, which we must do if in fact we're going to uh, really have normal relations with Cuba. So there are two bills, one with Congressman Sanford, Mark Sanford, Republican from South Carolina, and Congressman Rangel from New York that we're working with to try to do that. But I think there are more members of Congress who want to support the full lifting of the embargo than not. I just think we don't have the critical mass yet, but I think when you look at what took place as it relates to taking Cuba off the list of uh, state sponsors of terrorism, the only way that executive action and that recommendation would not hold from the president, from the executive branch, is if there were a resolution of disapproval from Congress. And so far, there has been no resolution of disapproval because I don't think they can get the votes. So that's a good sign that perhaps before President Obama leaves office, we can get these two bills passed, with it, which would then bring us into the, the world of reality <laughs> as it relates to normal relations with the country 90 miles away. That's a very sanguine view. Uh, Nick, do they look at this optimistically in Cuba for the most part? Are they um, chomping at the bit 
for the open up? Sure, I'm, people in Cuba are thrilled by this. Uh, in fact, uh, Univision did a poll there, one of the first times that anyone's tried to do a real comprehensive survey of Cuban attitudes about, about this process and about um, even their own political system. They surveyed 1,200 adults. Um, and uh, the Washington Post was a, a co-sponsor of, of, that, of that effort. And uh, the result that they, they got was uh, over 95% of Cubans were in favor of this reconciliation with the United States. Um, president Obama's approval rating was also 80% in, in Cuba, but he's not the president of Cuba. Um, so I would, I, uh, there's overwhelming enthusiasm for this process. People, I think, are going into this a bit skeptical because it's hard to believe it, that, that things are, are really going to change, but um, they're particularly hopeful that this is going to um, bring uh, significant improvement to the, you know, to the Cuban economy. Um, and, and, you know, Cubans also, um, I, in fact, I was talking to some White House officials about this uh, in Washington earlier this week, and they describe it as um, the desire for normalcy, you know, just, the, just, to, just to return to a normal relationship. The, the tension is gone, and, um, and, and, and people can kind of move ahead and turn the page, and that's, that seems to be where things are going. Well, of course, Congresswoman, when I was there, um, with my wife, we were both struck by the spirit of the people and, you know, the vitality, the music, this soulfulness and all of that, uh, great food and music uh, all over the place. Um, but there has been kind of a hovering sense of fear. America, American capital will go in and turn it into Disneyland. I'm sure you've heard that scenario. You know, there's going to be all this capital investment may help the people, but whatever charm Cuba has, charm in spite of wretched poverty, I might add, uh, Things are going to change and be transformed because all these American capitalists are going to be looking to invest and create malls and Disneylands and things of that sort. What do you anticipate along those lines? Well, first, I have a great deal of, of faith and hope um, in the Cuban people, and I think they really understand how they have to move forward and preserve, uh, for example, many of the beautiful old buildings on the Malecon. Uh, I visited Cuba with a delegation of architects, international delegation of architects, uh, several members of Congress, Congressman Sam Farr and myself went several years ago. And what the International Association was concerned about, rightfully so, was that these buildings and that, that the architectural integrity of the city be preserved and when, in fact, the Walmarts of the world or the Kmarts of the world or some of the big box stores saw these opportunities it, once the embargo were lifted, what were they, in, were they clear on what was going, could possibly take place? And so the architects had some um, film and videos of graphics of what the, the beautiful Malacorn would look like and what Old Havana could look like if in fact the the stores came in, the condos were built, and you know, if it became very Americanized. And I was very uh, impressed with the Cubans' response and, and their uh, planning and how they've taken into account 20, 30 years out if, in fact, this takes place. So, of course, you never know, but I mean, you look at now the old cars, there are companies now that uh, have been. Uh, renovating these old cars, painting them. The car that I travel in oftentimes there is named Lola. It's a pink old Chevy. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they've got a company now of these cars that are like taxis. You, you know the taxi company? But they seem to have really said, look, we're not going to sell these cars. These are our taxis. These are our cars. We're going to preserve them. We're going to, yes, have a business. We're going to make money, but we're, and we're going to transport tourists around but we want you to get a feel for what it's been like in Cuba for the last 50 years, but we certainly are not going to sell these cars. So you never know, but I, I'm pretty ho hopeful and optimistic that they understand and that they get it. They keep General Motors and uh, Chrysler perhaps from the other side of the border. <laughs> uh, I mean, the automotive industry has always been looking to Cuba when yeah. a, a relationship. Well, they need parts and they need, I yeah. mean, I have seen some amazing repair work done. Uh, <laughs> With, you know, 1950s cars, you know, they break down on the road, the, the driver gets out, and in 20 minutes, we're going again. And so there, I think 
some of our companies may learn a little bit about <laughs> auto mechanics <laughs> by understanding how the Cubans have maintained these cars for decades. And so I, I think they've got it under control. Nick, you've lived on and off there for nine years now, and uh, certainly there was suffering under the boycott, and there was a great deal of uh, certainly anger um, at the United States government being branded, uh, branding Cuba as a terrorist state and all the rest of that, but there seemed to be so much goodwill toward Americans. Uh, have, have you felt that? Have you experienced that for the most part? Sure. I'm, I travel all over Latin America for my, for my job, and I like to say that Cuba is the most pro-American place in the hemisphere. Um, and that's due to a couple things. The, uh, the Castro government has always made a distinction between the policies of the United States government and the American people. Um, and uh, there's never any, I think, any question that um, there's a, a deep and abiding um, uh, affinity for the United States, for our shared history, and particularly for certain elements of American culture that are, um, you know, also also shared. Or I shouldn't even say American culture, but really, um, uh, you know, things like baseball, um, music, um, uh, you know, love of movies, and that's one of the things that I think Americans pick up on when they visit Cuba. Um, is but you couldn't see Birdman there. Right? You had to see it on the plane, right? No, I, I, I'm sure I could have gotten Birdman from the guy selling pirate DVDs on the corner, but uh, I've, been a little, I've been a little busy. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing, um, and anyone who's been to Cuba has probably had this experience. You know, you go and think, oh, was, I wonder if these people are mad at us because we've had an embargo against them for 50 years. And then you get there, and, and you're you know, embraced by, by Cubans who um, don't see it that way at all. And, you know, Cubans, there are nearly two million Cuban and Cuban Americans in the United States. Everyone knows someone, and everyone wants to visit the United States. And, uh, and they're also eager um, to be able to do that and to be able to, uh, to have that kind of relationship again in which um, people can move back and forth easier and um, don't feel like these artificial barriers are, are in the way anymore. Well, what about within Cuba, Barbara Lee? I mean, you anticipate that there's been certainly a good deal of repression and uh, people put in jail. In fact, I think you're going to be doing a fundraiser with Alan Gross. Maybe we can talk about that. But uh, the sense of um, things opening up domestically within Cuba, possibly even more liberty, more democracy, is that something that you're looking to? Uh... Well, the whole issue of human rights is something that I think all of us are concerned about, not only in Cuba, but throughout the world. And I think the Cubans, when I was involved, say, for example, with the discussions around Alan Gross or Elian Gonzalez, for example, which we were very intricately involved in, uh, myself and, and Congresswoman Maxine Waters, the uh, point about human rights is, is extremely important. And the Cubans always, their response is, look, if we had normal relations, if we had dialogue, we could talk about human rights here, and believe you me, human rights in the United States, if in fact, and, and I always talk to our government and say, once you put that on the table, which we should, don't think it's a one-way discussion, <laughs> you know? And so the, uh, the issue around uh, pr political prisoners, I was in Panama recently with the president and the delegation uh, at the summit of the Americas, and we witnessed some brouhaha there. Uh, and so you have a lot of, uh, of issues that the Cuban government says they will address if, in fact, we have uh, normal relations and a respectful dialogue with regard to human rights. I've seen a change over the years. There's certainly uh, issues around what we view as, as democratic elections and democracy. I've been there during their elections the, at the local level. I mean, we know their government. Uh, it's, it's top down, but at the local level, their CDRs and all their uh, priests, I mean, they have a pretty high turnout rate during their elections, <laughs> you know, the way they're structured. So we have to understand that we have to approach uh, repression and human rights concerns from a position of trying to understand and know what is taking place there, while at the same time recognizing that all countries, including Cuba and the United States, must, must adhere to the international standards of human rights. And that's, I think, a very important point that can't be lost. 
Do you feel positive about that, Nick? I mean, there, there has been, you know, especially under Fidel, some very serious violations of human rights going ongoing for many years, and a lot of repression and a lot of uh, pretty much one-sided, one-dimensional allowing uh, or permitting media broadcasts, and, and for that matter, print journalism, which you're in. Sure. Um, Cuba is an authoritarian system, and uh, there are um, it is it is the most tightly controlled um, and least uh, it's really the only country in the Americas that doesn't allow uh, its citizens to directly elect their leaders or to elect their leaders. Obviously, we have an electoral college, but essentially, people here can still vote for who they want. Um, and among among other uh, uh, you know I issues in Cuba, uh, I mean, what's what's changed is that um, under Raúl Castro. Uh, political dissidents are not sentenced to long-term uh, prison terms uh, in the way that they were in the past. Um, there is a little bit more latitude for expression, but uh, the government has made very clear that it's not going to tolerate any disturbance on the streets. The streets belong to the state. Um, there's no right of assembly. There's no uh, ability to organize or have any... The Communist Party continues to be the only um, uh, party that's allowed. And um, at the same time, I think um, you know we've seen a we've seen a greater degree of uh, of ability. I mean, Cubans. If you if you've been there recently or and had been there in the past, everyone one of the things people notice is that Cubans are speaking their mind a lot more freely. There's less fear, um, and and even from coming from Raúl Castro himself, there is a um, and you know an invitation to. To, to speak up about things that aren't functioning in the society. There's, there's a greater um, uh, latitude about, about talking about uh, uh, economic liberalization, the ways in which the government bureaucracy doesn't work. Um, so I think that they're, they're willing to experiment with a little bit more um, political freedom, so to speak, as long as it doesn't represent a direct challenge to the, to the state or to, to stability. And, got to keep in mind that the thing that they are most wary of and the thing that, um, that their uh, security apparatus is designed to, uh, to, to prevent is some kind of disturbance or, or, or instability that would, um, that would you know, potentially get out of hand. And that's, let me, yeah. that's let me what just they follow that up with something quickly, and I want to go to Congresswoman Lee. Um, if things are, and when Raul Castro came into power, there was a sense that things were starting to shift, perhaps, not seismically, but from Fidel in terms of opening up more uh, freedoms. But the thing that strikes so many people that go to Cuba, and it struck me when I was there, was how you could be a neurosurgeon and make considerably less income than somebody who's waiting on your table or carrying your suitcases. I mean, there's an economy that really is out of whack by any standards. Um, do you see that opening up now, possibly? It, it is opening up, yes. It is opening yes, up? Yes, yeah. it is opening up, and it's creating a, it's creating a lot of um, problems for the government. I mean, uh, in some ways, the, mm, the vaunted you know, medical system that has um, uh, had a lot of uh, success and has been a model for, for many other nations and is one of the uh, kind of the pillars of the Cuban Revolution is facing a crisis because... Um, so many of uh, educated Cubans and, and uh, you know highly trained, highly skilled doctors are are leaving. Um, they're either going abroad because it's easier to travel now. Well, when Chavez to, was in power in Venezuela, they were all go so many of them were going there. Uh, they were going there as part of a government program, yeah. um, but a lot of them were also not not staying in that program, and they were going abroad. The United States has actually has policies that incentivize them to defect from those programs and to come to the United States. That's very controversial, um, but but in but in general, at, you know, out to the degree that the, that the uh, economy opens up and liberalizes, and Cubans are able to work um, uh, for themselves or privately or in small businesses, it makes it very hard um, for young people, in particular, to want to stay or, or choose a career in medicine, knowing that they're going to struggle economically in that field. Um, so it's it's unclear how they're going to be able to maintain that type of system. Yeah. Well, Congresswoman Lee. Yeah, well, you know, they're not going to be able to maintain that type of system, but I think uh, what's important for us to recognize is as we move toward normalizing relations and, and ending the embargo, don't look for Cuba to shift from a communist country to our form of a Western democracy. I mean, we have to recognize, just as we do with China and Vietnam, 
we have to stay on the, you know, keep the pressure on on the human rights fronts, but we also need to make sure that issues such as inequality, and, and this is the new front that we have to look at in Cuba, and that is the, uh, the gap between Afro-Cubans and white Cubans because of remittances. After the revolution, you know, 95, 99% of Afro-Cubans stayed in Cuba because the revolution provided social justice and benefits, which lifted them, lifted Afro-Cubans at least uh, moving into, or at least out of almost indentured servitude into, you know, poverty, then into what middle class that they have. But now what you have is the remittance policy, which, you know, Cuban Americans are allowed to send money back to their family. Well, the Afro-Cubans don't have families in America. And so you see this, and I've talked to the Cuban government about this and the U.S. government, so you see this racial gap growing, and you see uh, Afro-Cubans uh, being less paid, you know, at the bottom of the barrel, and white Cubans beginning to uh, have the businesses and the, the investments from their families and being able to get better paying jobs and create entrepreneurial opportunities for their family. And the Afro-Cubans are not receiving those benefits. There's definitely so, a kind of rigidity of the system there where the Afro-Cubans were much more menial uh, in terms of the work they were doing and were not getting the wages from everything I was able to glean. Yeah. Just a quick question, uh, but an important one. You've always been associated with wanting this to happen and with being a champion of mm -hmm. opening up relations and everything. What, this, I, I think it's safe to say there's been a passion of yours. What started that? What's the genesis of that? I went to Cuba for the first time in, I think it was 1976 or 1977, with the National Conference of Black Lawyers. I was working for then Congressman Dellums. And I wanted to see during that time why there was a, an embargo, what the realities of Cuban the world of Cuba looked like and why the United States would not uh, engage in normal relations. So I went down, visited, met a lot of Cubans, began to look at their system, the judicial system, the prison system, their economic system, and so I began to study life in Cuba and the Cuban government. And I realized then that there was no reason that there should be a blockade and an embargo and uh, no contact. This no contact doesn't lead to peace and security and, and normal relations in the world. So I started continuing to go down there with delegations by myself, you know, under the Treasury Department regulations. And I think since then I've been at least 22, 23 times. But I think, and my passion about this is that first, Americans have a right to travel. We hear what's taking place in Cuba only from what we hear, what we read, we don't know because we can't get on a plane or a boat and go there. So why should Americans be denied that right? That's the first thing. So I got pretty angry because people I knew wanted to go and they weren't a congressional staff or the member of the California legislature or a member of Congress and they could not go, or a journalist, and they couldn't go. And so that was part of it. And the second part was this is an Afro-Hispanic nation 90 miles away and we could benefit so much from what is taking place in Cuba in terms of medical and scientific research. The Cubans could benefit so much from what we are doing. And so there's a natural kind of partnership that could develop. And, and I saw this, and I still see this. And I'm going to continue until we have full diplomatic relations. And I think that's what's key. All of the issues around human rights and the issues that Guantanamo they have with us, of course, uh, you know, so there are going to be a lot of, lot of tough discussions that are going to be held. But bottom line is, you know, I think it's when I worked on the Elion case, I mean, it was ridiculous that they would not return Elion to his father. And so that was another, it was, my social worker passion came out then, like, send this young boy home. And so I got very involved in the negotiation around that. When I saw the Latin America Medical School, you know, Afri African American Latino students here, brilliant students can't afford to get into medical school. So I worked with the Cubans and said, look, we've got students who would love to come here. So now we actually have about 100 and, I don't know, 150 U.S. 
students at the Latin American Medical School, most of which are from California. Yes, you know, quite a few. So a lot of them from your district. <laughs> from my Council. district, of course. And they come back and they do quite well. So each time I go, I see something else that could benefit, you know, this, our citizens and could benefit Cuba. And so that's kind of just... Just imports. When we were there, uh, we were told that uh, Cuba has to get sugar via Vietnam now, which is crazy. Sense. I mean, I can't even imagine uh, why that is the case when sugar was such a leading... Uh, export of Cuba for so many years, but I'm also wondering, um, we've got a candidate now uh, for the GOP by the name of Marco Rubio, and um, along with, uh, <laughs> well, he, you know, I mean, it's not only Marco Rubio alone who's in opposition, obviously, but there are a number of Republicans who are probably, I mean, it was, it was certainly enlightening to hear you talk about how things are being streamlined and moving forward, but at the same time, there is a lot of resistance, you know? You but the public, about? 75, 80 percent of the public want to see the president's policies and normalization take place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be an uphill battle, yes, with uh, some Republican candidates, but I think that uh, even, I mean, you look at the business interests. You know, even in the 70s when I was going down there, Kirby Jones and Alomar, they were sending businesses from Iowa and agribusinesses down into Cuba in the 70s and the 80s to look at the possible trade benefits. Now the U.S. Chamber, they were there, uh, they go down several times a year, to look at the kind of economic benefits and the jobs that could be created in America. And so I think it's just a matter of time for the Republican candidates to begin to talk about the economic benefits to their districts and to this country because certainly they're, they are enormous and certainly we are and are and will continue to lose market share if we don't get in there. And so I believe that the uh, chambers and the business community will end up driving these candidates to at least get them to be neutral rather than to want to stay in the past 50 years ago and, and reiterate the same old policies that have not worked. Could you talk a little bit about where you see some of these investors and some of this capital going? Where do they see real opportunity? Are you getting feedback on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, of course, in the agricultural sector, mm -hmm. but also in the construction business. Uh, I mean, when you go to Cuba, you don't see much paint, you know, just basics, paint. Uh, when you look at um, medicines, the pharmaceutical business and the medical supply business, there have been exemptions for those companies to go and do business in Cuba, but the Financial transactions have been so cumbersome that most U.S. companies that engage, that want to sell their pharmaceuticals and medical equipment to Cuba can't do it because of the way that has happened. But now, thank goodness, those regulations out of Treasury are changing. So you have the pharmaceutical, you have the agricultural sector, of course, the uh, tourist sector, you have the construction sectors, and you have, uh, I think, some of the, the educational sectors in terms of the types of university exchanges on the nonprofit front. You, I think we'll see a lot of, of uh, intellectual type of transactions take place between visiting students and professors from Cuba and also from America to Cuba. So I think that's going to be the humanitarian uh, side of it's going to be enormous. My, my Nick, Cuban uh, friends, uh, they say ahead, they, yeah. they really want, they, what they really want is Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> they want a Home Depot. <laughs> Maybe not a Walmart, but they want Home Depot. Um, they got to get a good paying job first <laughs> to be able to afford yeah, plus, Home Depot um, prices. Electricity. Home Depot is a lot cheaper than the Cuban hardware store, let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, I was just going to ask you, though, about there's a, there's a book out that's getting um, a good deal of attention, uh, not as much as the Schweitzer book about Hillary Clinton, but it is getting a lot of attention. This is a book about the Ochoa trial and uh, the whole sense of... Uh, I mean, essentially, it's, it's kind of a, a right-wing guy who's an author, but um, he paints a picture of Castro not so much as a violator of human rights, but as a hoodlum, as a thug, as a kind of mafia kingpin, and tries to bring in research that suggests that um, that whole trial of a... And you might want to address that and, and give some background on it, but that what really was behind uh, the assassination of this general uh, in Cuba was... Castro is making great profit off of drugs. Now, I'm not trying to allege that this is even the case or anything, but factoring in a lot of the opposition coming, especially from Florida, from nationals in Florida, and this book getting a lot of attention, particularly on places like Fox News and so forth, I mean, it is a factor. Well, I haven't seen Fox News recently, so I haven't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of this book. 
Um, I haven't either, but I'm assuming that. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, everyone in Cuba knows the Ochoa story. I don't know if there's anything new to say about it. Um, you know, he was he was the uh, top-ranking general after, obviously, after Raúl Castro, in the Cuban military, and he was um, a, a, a hero both from the revolution and also from the wars in in Angola, in particular, in the 1970s and 80s. He also says, by the way, in this book that Castro is bringing in a lot of stuff from Angola, mostly jewels and diamonds and things of that sort. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't think that that, I mean, I think that's relevant in, in maybe in M Miami um, right now, but uh, I think, you know, most Cubans have moved on. I mean, the Ochoa trial was significant because it was the first time, it came right as the Soviet Union's support for Cuba was crumbling. And so it was this moment of, of vulnerability. The government uh, put the trial on television and he was sentenced to the firing squad and they carried it out. So it was a very chilling moment in Cuban history. It was a moment when I think a lot of people um, started to realize that maybe the revolution wasn't as infallible as they, they thought it was. Um, but again, you know, I think that was, that's ancient history in Cuba right now. You know, well, so is, uh, 25 years ago, and, so, and people have moved on. Forgive me, but so is uh, the Cuban ties to the Soviet Union. I mean, we're not in a Cold War anymore, I think it's safe to say. And as a result, it makes it even more likely that this kind of connection between the United States and Cuba would be enhanced, because well, who Raul, knows what Putin's doing? He's going into Ukraine. Well, Raul, well what Putin is doing is Raul, he, was, he was meeting with Raul Castro today. Raul Castro is in Moscow right now, and he was meeting with, with Putin. It's the 70th anniversary of their victory. Um, He's much more pragmatic, isn't he? Raul Castro? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And so, I mean, we've seen some changes. Uh... He's hedging. I mean, um, listen, you know, Cuba's, uh, um, you, know, you know, one of the great strategic mistakes that Fidel Castro made was to depend so heavily on a single country in the Soviet Union. And that was in some ways repeated with the reliance on Venezuela and the relationship with Hugo Chavez. So now, uh, on this particular tour, pay attention, you can pay attention to where Raul Castro went. He went to Algeria which is a, a major oil producing country um, that Cuba has a long history with. And they're trying to set up uh, kind of doctors for oil programs um, with other allies. And, and now he's in, he's in Moscow and he's hedging. I mean, he, I think you know, the Cuban government would very much like to take advantage of these opportunities with the United States. But if it goes bad and, and something goes wrong, they know that they need to maintain trade ties to China, Russia, and to really to all comers. And that's, that's also a new attitude. I mean, um, you know, I think they want to send the signal that they're open to business with the world. And, and while they have, you know, they favor a certain type of business, um, they're looking to diversify as much as possible their trade relations. Which is why it is extremely important that we not continue to be isolated. And that's what, at the summit of the Americas, uh, our delegation mate would, met with at least eight heads of state from the region, from the Western Hemisphere. Barring none, from left to right, they all said that the most important thing for them in terms of our, their bilateral relations with the United States was lifting the embargo <laughs> against Cuba. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we've got to understand if we need, if we want to, which we should continue to be players on the world stage uh, with the Western Hemisphere and, and everywhere else in the world, we have to do something in terms of at least being in a position to be able to compete with the rest of the world as it relates to Cuba. There's something else though, that occurs to me when you were talking, uh, Congresswoman, about the advantages from both sides. There's the human side of this. I mean, here's Cuba only 90 miles away from the United States. And there have been many families that have been divided for years. And so the opening up of relations, I mean, just remember when there was some communication between North and South Korea and these people were able to, very, very poignant, you know, bringing people back together who had been separated by these divisions. And this is what we'll be able to see. Yeah, it's, it's about family values, really. And, mm -hmm. and it's important that families be able to unify and reunify. And that, now that is taking place. You know, if you can afford to go to Cuba from Miami, or from wherever, you can go back and forth as many times as, as you want. And, and you can see the excitement, both from Miami and from the Cuban side, to see one, to see their relatives again. I mean, it's a, it's a very happy moment to see this, and you would hope that, that I met with one of these times last year when I was in Cuba, a woman who was in her 90s, and uh, she wanted to visit with her uh, great-grandchild, 
And so she had applied for a visa to come to the United States and uh, hadn't heard back. And so we helped her get that sorted through. But, you know, just the yearning to see one's family member and to be together is extremely, I think, important within the context of who we are as a nation and what we value, too. And what about the yearning for many Cubans to want to come here permanently? I mean, certainly, one got the, I got the sense of that when I was in Cuba, that many of them would love to be living in Florida. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we would see, or if there's a possibility of seeing defections and people wanting to establish themselves in the United States. How, what I'm really getting at is how free will the transportation and likelihood be Cubans coming here? If we're going to open up plane rides to Cuba, which we're going to be doing, and people are going to be going down there like the Canadians are now and the Europeans and Mexicans, it's a great place to visit, how much is going to come north? Well, like Nick said, Cubans love Americans, and I think we're going to see a lot. Cubans can come here now, and a lot do stay. And the, I think what's important is that that shouldn't be a negative. If, if Cubans, Cuban citizens want to come to the United States and live here, if you, United States citizens want to go to Cuba and live there, what's the problem? I'm sorry, but I'm remembering the Marielitos. I can't <laughs> help it. I have a mind that goes back to history in that way. I mean, that was a big problem, though, under Carter's administration. Oh, I remember Frank Church and the Church Committee yeah. and opening up. But the, this is how many years later? You know, I mean, Cuban families are traveling now back and forth. And I think that, uh, you know, we probably, you know, I don't want to see a brain drain which is taking place now in Cuba, yeah. you know, because of, of the imbalance in terms of wages and, and the poverty that exists still. And, you, you know, I would hope that people see the new policies towards the United States as a real incentive to stay in Cuba because hopefully their economy can, can get a lot better with the type of, uh, of trade and the type of economic going back and forth and benefits between the United States and Cuba and that they see a, a, a more hopeful future. We're going to bring the audience in this before we do. Could you say something about Alan Gross? This is, after all, the Jewish Community <laughs> Center and your connection with yeah. him. Well, first of all, I have uh, actually had the privilege to uh, go to the and visit with members of the Jewish community in Havana. Uh, and I went to the synagogue and really had, had a, a wonderful experience getting to know the community there in Havana. Up until Alan was arrested, I, I had not had a chance to meet with, with members of the Jewish community. But once Alan was arrested, I got involved in trying to help him uh, free Allen, get out of jail, uh, I got a chance to really uh, get to know members of the Jewish community there. And it was a very interesting uh, time. Allen was in jail five years. Of course, he was incarcerated, you know, for selling, for taking in uh, communications equipment to the Jewish community. Uh, after the Helms-Burton law was passed, Cuba passed laws that were very strict about bringing in certain types of equipment. And one of the issues that I, I really was concerned about, because everyone asked me, Barbara Lee, why are you, you know, this is a spy. How how do you get involved in this? Why are you doing this? I said, first of all, I think the sentence, 15 years, was too long. You know, so just based on a human rights issue, you know, I'm going to get involved. But secondly, I'm on the subcommittee that funds these Helms Burden democracy promotion programs. And I looked at this contract, like I look at all of them, and in no way do these consultants, which Alan was, do this work and really have an indemnification clause in their contract, or nor is, nor is it disclosed that if you engage in this kind of work, just know you could be subject to arrest because it does violate Cuban law. I mean, the United States is doing all kinds of work over there. The, the, the Twitter, democracy promotion kind of undercover work under USAID, the AIDS, you probably have read about some of these that have been exposed in the last year. And so, you know, our government is engaged in, we say not trying to overthrow the government, but trying to spread democracy in Cuba. And so Alan was on <laughs> one, of those, one of those deals. And I fault the U.S. government for not telling these people, these contractors, that um, they could be subject to arrest. And so based on those two reasons, I got involved in it. Well, I have to tell one story before we go to you, our audience, because uh, Congresswoman Lee mentioned being with the Jewish community in Havana, and that was true in the case. I went on one of these JCC trips and had occasion to meet a woman who was sort of the really uh, 
ex officio head of the Jewish community there. And there were many pictures of her with Fidel Castro. And uh, I had occasion to ask about how did she get to meet Castro and so forth. And when John Paul was there, the pope, uh, he went around to different churches and synagogues, a uh, few synagogues that exist in Cuba. And she invited him to come back to the synagogue on Hanukkah. And he asked, what's Hanukkah? And she said, it's a celebration of a revolution. He said, I'll be there. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. She told me that story and I saw those pictures. My picture is there now too, I want you to know. It's, okay. it's a great story. <laughs> Let's bring up the lights. And, um, and so Alan will be here on Saturday. And bottom line is the Pope, our government, the Cuban government, we were engaged for years in, in some very intense negotiations. And the Cuban, the three Cubans that were left out of the Cuban Five and Alan, not that it was a prisoner exchange, but both sides have their prisoners back. <laughs> oh, it wasn't, wasn't a prisoner exchange? <laughs> okay, so questions for, for Barbara Lee or Nick or Michael, and we'll start right here in the front. Hi. I uh, uh, and my friend Lois Ann, we happen to be, not happen to be, we were in Havana at the uh, election night of 2012 when uh, President Obama was reelected. And you thought San Francisco was happy? You should have been in Havana. They were dancing in the streets. They were so, so happy. My question is about um, uh, Los Cinco. I never heard about them until I was there, and their pictures are plastered all over. The, the ones that the, uh, the five, five Cuban, the five. yeah, Los Cinco, five. yeah. Was that, were they exchanged? For Alan Grossman, I'm not. I They're out. Read. The two had been released from prison, and the Cuban Five is a long, complicated case. Brothers yeah. to the rescue. There was, there was, you know, a very long case. But the Cubans and the the testimony of, during the court, you know, their defense attorneys say they're innocent and they were not involved in what they were incarcerated for, which was what 15 to life. I mean, they got very long sentences. Th two of them were released several years ago, a couple of years ago. The three were released recently. Alan Gross was released recently. The negotiations, though, that took place around the release weren't in the context of an a exchange. Could I just add, so the, the, the way the deal was constructed was that the Cubans exchanged a uh, U.S. intelligence asset in Cuba, who's basically a U.S. spy from within the Cuban government who had already served 20 years. Um, and uh, he was exchanged for the three remaining members of the Cuban Five. Alan Gross was released on humanitarian grounds. Yeah. But also around, around the same time, the, the opening for the normalization came. The president, at that, it was during that same week or the negotiation that part of what happened on our side was the president issued the executive orders to begin to normalize relations. So all of this sort of came within the same Much. Yeah. Yeah. Question down here in the center. After the revolution, I remember Fidel Castro uh, came to the United States for help. Now, what happened there? Uh, I don't quite understand. I mean, I was young, and I didn't quite. I know. I remember that he came to to the Latin community and everywhere for uh, support and help. Uh, how come they we didn't make any deals with him or something? Can I can I just say when you get home, I suggest you go on YouTube and look up Fidel Castro, Edward R. Murrow pajamas, and you'll see something very amusing, which is Fidel Castro doing an interview from the top floor of the Havana Libre after the revolution in his pajamas in English on American television. He was also uh, wow. doing some chicken frying, I think, wasn't he? Or something along I didn't know about that, but... Yeah. So that's but, when he stayed at the Teresa Hotel in No, no, Harlem, that was much later. This? The Teresa Hotel. later. This was immediately, uh, this was like 1959, yeah. But <laughs> it's, uh, it's a long story, but... Um, I mean, famously, Richard Nixon traveled. Richard Nixon met with, with Castro soon after the revolution and came away from the meeting convinced he was indeed a communist, even though he didn't say he was. He'd been saying he was not a communist. Um, but American suspicion of, of Castro was there long before uh, he took power. And how many times we try to assassinate him? You, you would have no better than me. <laughs> Congressman. <laughs> Quite a few. Okay, our next I'm question. sure it didn't come from your office. 
our next question. You remember Howard Hunt's exploding cigar, for example? I mean, some of these some of these notions that the Nixon administration had. It was the Kennedy administration. Were, it was the Kennedy administration. Uh, Operation, it was like bad Ian Fleming. You know what I mean by bad Ian Fleming? Yeah. Operation okay. Mongoose, if you want. Our to next question oh, yeah, here in the front. Um, do you foresee any change in the immigration policy if there is normalization of relations? Um, the so-called, I think it's dry feet or wet feet, dry feet, whatever it is, where Cubans have that advantage if they get here, they're basically here? Yeah, so uh, important, important fact to keep in mind. So um, migration from Cuba to the United States is actually at a 10-year high. Um, it's about 40,000 people a year. 20,000 of them are issued immigration visas through the United States consulate in Havana. Another 20,000 come illegally. Most of them are not rafters. They arrive through Mexico. And increasingly, they arrive at the Miami airport with third country passports. There's a very much a sense in Cuba right now that the, the Cuban Adjustment Act of 1966, that has been the, the kind of bedrock uh, migration policy of the United States um, for all these years, that it is, in, is now um, in jeopardy because of this, this new reconciliation. And so in Cuba, there's very much a sense that you need to hurry to get to the United States as soon as you can in order to secure your residency before that law changes. And it isn't so much that things are more repressive or things are worse, it's that having the ability to um, establish U.S. residency and eventually get a passport means you can go back and forth much more freely. You can take advantage of the best of kind of what both systems have to offer. And increasingly, we see Cubans who live in Miami and come back to Havana for Santeria ceremonies and dental work. Um, all of which undermines the logic of political asylum that the Adjustment Act is built on. So yes, there's a, there's a worry that that's changing. The, uh, in Congress, everyone has assured us, uh, including the President, um, that the law isn't changing and is not up for change. But I think most Cubans see the writing on the but wall. But that doesn't mean it shouldn't change. Because yeah. if we have normal relations with a country, and if, you, if we end the embargo, why would, the, uh, why would we need a, a, the Cuban Adjustment Act on the books? I mean, we pass that for obvious reasons. But if those reasons no longer exist, even though Congress may not do it, my, you know, we, we should think about it. Congressman, I don't know if you can quantify this, but have this, uh, the sanctions and the boycott been more had more of a harmful impact on Cuba than, let's say, they are presently and until maybe we find out otherwise having on Iran? That's hard to, uh, that's the sanctions as it relates to Iran versus sanctions on, against Cuba. Iran has oil. Yeah, Cuba, yeah, Iran has oil, but also Cuba, sanctions have been imposed on Cuba for so long, yeah. 50 years, that they've, as we say in the black church, made a way out of no way. And <laughs> like I was telling you a story about how they repaired the cars, the 1950s cars. And so they've, they've been very creative in how they've been able to handle sanctions. And yes, it's really uh, impacted, say, their healthcare system because I, and you know, Nick, you've heard stories of people dying because they couldn't get a dialysis machine or the, pay, the parts from America for Equip, medical equipment and people would die as a result of that. And so it's been very, very hard on the Cuban people, uh, but they've learned, and I think the resilience and their determination and why I don't think they're gonna, you know, you know, really succumb to the Home Depots and Walmarts of the world is because they really have had to go through some very tough times and learn how to live under these sanctions Question. and learn how to sacrifice. Plus, the Iranians Question. had sanctions coming from other countries, from Europe, for example. And uh, I was just interested, I'm always interested in the idea of how, the efficacy of sanctions in general and what kind of effects they have or consequences. Hi, thanks to all three of you for the important work you all do. Um, Cuba is a small island nation, and what discussion is going on there now about the effects of climate change, sea level rise? And Congresswoman Lee, when you're the future ambassador there, what do you see for? <laughs> we'll, see, we'll, we'll see what Rubio has to say about that. <laughs> what do you see as the prospects for increased environmental cooperation between the U.S. and Cuba beyond the small level there is now? 
Right now, I think there, there's a keen awareness of climate change in Cuba and throughout the Caribbean for obvious reasons. I think right now we see some pretty decent cooperation on the environmental front just, you know, in terms of the oil spills. And, you know, I don't think they're drilling now, but they had begun to drill. Are they still drilling there? I don't, I don't think they are. They've, but they've, we've they've, been cooperating with uh, their comparable EPA and Department of Energy and ours. And so that's where, even before the new regulations were developed, there's been a strong cooperative arrangement. One correction. Cuba is not a small island. It's 770 miles long. It's almost as long as the state of California. Next question is right here in the front. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jacques Talaferro, La Hitch Digital Media. And thank you very much for having this uh, discussion here. It's a very important discussion. Um, just recently, I did an interview with uh, Dr. Alejandro um, uh, Toledo, and he's uh, actually a USF uh, graduate. Uh, and he was the former president of Peru. And he talked very uh, in depth about um, Afro Peruvians and uh, Hispanic Peruvians. He was the first uh, indigenous president that was uh, voted into Peru. Um, before I go on, I must say, um, every time I see you at Congresswoman Lee, it brings a smile to my face because you're the only one to stand up against going to war in the Middle East, uh, in Congress, in the Senate. And that really took, <laughs> it really took some nerve. I, I'm pretty bold, but I don't think I would have been able to do that. I might have abstained, but I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> uh, the question is about um, the exchange of uh, artists uh, and athletes into uh, the US, and also how much influence does um, Russia still have in Cuba? Uh, and also, I have Haitian roots. Uh, there was at one time a move to make a united uh, Caribbean, I heard this from uh, Mighty Sparrow, the uh, artist, when I was in Jamaica. And if you know anything about that, I'd like to know more about that. And um, she's telling me not to ask any more questions. That, that's a lot. Do you have a, uh, thank you very much. I think we have time maybe for one or two more. Wait, wait. I haven't heard I think... about a United Care recently. I know Mighty Sparrow in the past, I, but Right now, I don't think that there's a move for that. Uh, of course, uh, Santiago de Cuba and Haiti, you know, Cuba's very close to Haiti, and, and there are a lot of cooperative exchanges between Haiti, but I've never heard. One time, Haiti was producing three times more sugar cane than all the islands combined, and the U.S. government stopped that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Do we, Barbara, do we have time for uh, one or two we more? We have a couple question more questions. Here on the right. right. Go ahead. I have to go there. Thank you. First, I have to apologize for my accent. I am Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for your work. I am a survivor of a dream and the betrayal of that dream. I am a betrayal of a survivor of a betrayal of a dream because we love Castro. We love to dream that Cuba could be a, another kind of country, not a folkloric country for the Americans. We wanted to build a real, a real country. And part of the dream was uh, schools education, and to build uh, the possibility that every Cuban, whatever color, whatever uh, situation, have, have the opportunity to go forward. It was a betrayal. Yes, there were schools, there were hospitals. I was a teacher, but the poverty increases, the marginalization increases. And we pay the price to be prisoners in our own country. We really, uh, l we don't have liberties. We don't have the right to speak up about our feelings, what goes on in the country. <coughs> there is a lot of suffering in this history. People killed, prisoners, 
people that died in the strait of the Florida trying to get out of the country, uh, people that are in Cuba in so such a difficult situation that I don't know how they survive. And we have a sense of humor, and we laugh about our situation. <coughs> Very good jokes. I would like to remember some in English to tell you. You will laugh out loud. <laughs> but the reality is that it's a lot of suffering. But there is a potential, potential, enormous potential in that country that comes from Jose Martí, just alone. And the question is, what kind of Cuba we are talking about? Another China? With the repression of a government that suppressed the human rights and control, control. And then a capitalism that goes there like a lion what kind of Cuba we are talking about. I hope and I dream in my Cuba. Ah, thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I think on that note. Yeah. Let me just, Barbara, just say something uh, because I'm going to turn things over back to Barbara Lane. I just want to say, first of all, thank you to both Nick Meroff and to Congresswoman Barbara Lee for excellent, enlightening conversation. Thank you, our audience, and let me say in conclusion, Viva los Estados Unidos, Viva Cuba. Thank That's you. it. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you all very much. Good evening. <laughs>